I'm actually starting from um, just referring back to the talk that I gave here um, earlier this year, whenever it was. Anyway. Um, and what I want to do then is to work with some wonderful musicians in order to, to try to take that a little bit further. Um, now, what I argued in that talk was that in the light of evidence from early recordings, um, we can think of the classical music business as a kind of policed utopia in which happiness and security depend on obedience to the imagined composer's wishes. And I went on to consider the possibility of undermining that state, that police state, um, and made some preliminary suggestions as to how that might be achieved. So it may be useful as a, as a next step to reframe um, that argument, and that's what I want to do um, now. The main points that I made on the basis of early recordings were that thanks to them, we now know that over time, performance style changes massively. And as the way the notes are played changes, so the character of the music made with scores changes. And so our view of the composer changes. It's also clear when one listens to the huge differences between early recordings and modern practice, that much more work, much more expressive, meaningful work is being done by the performer than we realized, and therefore less is being done by the composer. It's not actually clear, I think, how much meaning is inherent in scores. That remains to be seen. Um, but it's certainly a lot less than we thought. And so I also argue that we cannot go on talking about pieces as if they were works. And musicologists have argued this for years, but it hasn't made the slightest difference to what they say. But it's really got to, because there are no pieces with fixed and clear identities. Nothing that could constitute a work. Um, nor can we go on talking about composers as if we knew their works because it's perfectly clear from the hugely different sounds and meanings they produce that we, could, we don't and can't. I also asked about our obligations to composers. And I suggested that for living composers, it's a matter of kind of good manners. This may sound terribly English. It's a, it's a kind of a courtesy to try to realize their intentions. I mean, composers are, are these very strange creatures who are imagining art in a medium in which they are not themselves able to communicate, or not to the extent that professional performers can communicate. It's a very, very strange phenomenon, the separation of these two things, but there it is. And, um, and so uh, what we need to do as performers is, is to take advantage of their presence for living composers, since they're here, and since they have ideas which are surely going to be interesting, to, to try to, to find out what it is they have in mind and to make that sound. And on the whole, um, when we do that, we produce all sorts of sounds they didn't imagine. Um, on the whole, most composers are happy with that. They find it interesting to hear what performers do with their scores, things they hadn't anticipated. And yet, when we think about performing dead composers, the idea that we might do something they hadn't anticipated or that they might actually be interested if we did seems really quite shocking. So let's move on to dead composers. What are our obligations to dead composers? And what I argued was that actually we don't have any. Um, history is interesting, but it's not regulative because the dead can't be harmed. Now there's, there's, there's philosophy on obligations to the dead and um, we could go into that. We can later if you want to, um, but I'm not going to stop and do that now. But let's just for the moment say that since um, when it comes down to ethics, the fundamental question is who is harmed and the answer is nobody. So is the listener harmed when they hear a different reading of a text? 
Well, if, if they are, then what kind of terrible things are being done to listeners, to audiences, when they go to the theatre to see Shakespeare? Do they feel damaged by seeing Henry IV Part I in a radically new light? Well, no, it's quite the opposite. That's why they go. They go because they know that they're going to hear this text, to experience this text in a new way. That is the point of theatre, to produce the text differently so that it has the opportunity to tell us something about ourselves, something about our situation. And that's why we go to the theatre. In this example, was Webster harmed when his White Devil of 1612 was produced like this, directed like this? Was the audience harmed? Are we bothered that it's not respecting the staging conventions of 1612? Well, remember, William Byrd was still alive when this play was first produced. Why don't we perform Byrd like this? Or, put it another way, why don't we perform Byrd like this? Why is it okay for words and appalling for music? You think words would need more historical authenticity, um, but apparently not. For opera, of course, we're used to this on stage. But in the pit, it's unthinkable. The classical music, the very idea of changing a score's meaning seems scandalous. Let me give you another example. This is going to be a little ludicrous, but then it's supposed to be. So bear with me. Imagine if Beethoven's fifth at the opening sounded tentative, simply pretending to be heroic, while actually, as the third phrase might suggest, it's running for its life before being shot. Something like this. Ta-ta-ta-tum, 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 ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-tum, ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-
is naturally correct. So instead of performing the composer or performing ourselves, we perform the state. When we play and sing, we willingly but slavishly sound the values of the musical state. Norms are, of course, oppressive, which is why students learning to behave within them become aware of gradually increasing fear. Fear of making a mistake, fear of playing out of style, fear of non-conforming. And with fear comes stress and anxiety and performance-related illness. The pressures on performers are terrifying, <clears throat> which makes it easy for last year's B-movie Grand Piano, if anybody's seen this, to ima- hope not, to imagine a pianist on stage turning the page to see this. <laughs> <laughs> This is what it's like. We all know what it's like performing on stage. It's like this. Okay? So, you know, we are constant. You can't quite see the red dot, can you, of the laser guided um, rifle. There's a red dot just on his nose there. Um, We are literally in the critic's sights. Now, this film has an incredibly silly plot, but it is horribly close to the daily truth of being a public musician. And I can't resist just taking a couple of minutes to play you an extract from the trailer. into this situation. It's complete madness. <clears throat> now, um, a, a little diversion into intellectual property law, and um, my thanks here to Matilda Pavis, who's given me this material. Um, IP law gives composers economic and moral rights, um, which include the right not to have their work subjected to derogatory treatment. Obviously, what's derogatory treatment is a matter for um, the lawyers to argue in court. But you can easily see that um, a composer could sue a performer if they didn't like the way they played their notes. Um, In France, this right is perpetual. So Berlioz's or Ramos or Machaut's descendants could sue performers today. Um, Machaut's descendants would probably have a very good case. Um, Now, this is allowed because the law sees performers as servants reproducing works, just the way that musicologists see them, and just the way that um, performance teachers and performers over generations have allowed themselves to be persuaded to see them, just the way the system sees them. Now, we've seen that actually this is not what happens in music. According to show us that. But the law doesn't know that. The law enshrines normative assumptions among judges and lawmakers. And in fact, the honest truth is, we may as well face this, that everybody who's ever written about the composer-performer relationship in normative terms has conspired in this, which must include all of us. Um, I don't think this can go on. Now, to see how deeply all this damages performers, we only need to remember that musical performance is only possible through embodiment. Performers make music through their bodies, and the more perfectly they make music, the more deeply and fully performance has become part of their bodies. In every sense, the way we make music concerns who we are, what we believe, what we think, what we feel, how we move, 
how we function. To control all these aspects of us through controlling our musicianship is oppression of the most far-reaching kind. When we allow our musical institutions, personified in teachers, adjudicators, critics, agents, and the rest, to rule what we are allowed to do as musicians, we allow them to control our whole selves. This is why it matters so much to know whether these controls are necessary. Is there a reasonable artistic basis for this much control? Does the state deserve its power, or has it simply acquired it in Darwinian fashion as a way of keeping itself in place, passing on its means? What I'm suggesting is that performance could be far more creative and varied, and no one would suffer. Now, perhaps that's a slight exaggeration, because a lot of people would be very unhappy at first, but they'd be the ones enforcing norms on everyone else. And any revolution has to face those kinds of people. But a musical practice that was both creative and persuasive, because that's required of every successful performance, that it be persuasive. In fact, it's all that's required, that it be persuasive. A musical practice that was both creative and persuasive would bring great rewards even economic rewards. Teachers and critics and all the rest would find their jobs a little harder, but not less interesting, I think. They'd actually have to think, which might not be such a bad thing. Um, musicians who were freer from fear, encouraged to think and perform more imaginatively, could be much happier. And provided the new freedom were not itself too terrifying, of course. But then, you know, it wouldn't be if, the, if the, the state was less oppressive in response to greater creativity. But I think that we can help with that um, by offering techniques to make experimentation easier. And this is absolutely crucial. This is what needs to be done through institutions like this. Given proper recognition of how much they contribute anyway, Performers could have their creativity protected under law and rewarded, just like composers. Composers might have to share a bit, but they should have been doing that for a long time. What's the alternative? If we carry on as we are, well, we can see it because it's happening already. We just let classical music die. Because it always sounds the same, people stop listening. And why go to a concert when you know what it's going to be like? The only reason to go is to be comforted. And fewer and fewer people um, are prepared to pay concert ticket prices just to be comforted. You know, it's not enough. Um, but classical music actually, you know, it doesn't need to die. What it needs is to live, obviously. And we can find new ways of performing these notes, or other notes if we prefer them. I don't think we have to be um, too uh, um, narrow about what constitutes the piece. And we can make something, you know, like all things that are alive, that changes. That's the key. Music has to be allowed to change. Now, how are we going to do this? I'm going to suggest, for the moment, two routes, just to, to get started, because uh, one can't take too large a step at a time. Um, and the routes I'm suggesting are, one, we listen to really old recordings to see how scores have worked differently in the past. And secondly, we can experiment. We can experiment wildly ourselves, looking for new ways of making scores work. So um, in my last talk, what I proposed was a radical performance project which had nine aims. And of those nine, this is the one that I'd like us to focus on today, to offer students a technique for expanding their imaginative relationship with scores. So we're looking for techniques that musicians can use to help them discover new ways of getting from one note to the next, essentially. New principles of melodic harmonic continuity. New relationships between notes. What we're doing is we're working towards new performance styles, but at the same time as working towards them, we're resisting them because we don't want to make new norms. It's the norms that are the problem. They become institutionalized, and then we're sunk. 
Or if we do start to tend towards new norms, then at least we recognize them for what they are and we train students constantly to challenge them instead of to obey them. There's one um, conservatoire in London which is at the moment considering introducing into its marking criteria for performances the notion of risk taking. And I think that's a very interesting idea. It remains to be seen whether they actually do it. Um, <clears throat> but actually, if there is going to be any norm, I think having risk taking as a positive factor. Um, in conservatory assessment would be a pretty good one. Now, what I was going to do at this stage was to hand over to Anna Scott in order to give us some examples of the first of these options that I've outlined. That is to say, listening really carefully to the way people played 100 years ago and seeing what we can learn from it, um, what we might be able to use today in order to experience um, scores, meanings coming from scores in rather different kinds of ways. Anna, unfortunately, is unwell, so I'm going to have to give you uh, at least some snapshots of her work um, in her absence, just in order to be able to give you some idea of how exciting this could be. Um, <clears throat> so what we're going to do is, is um, look at what she's been able to do with early recorded Brahms play. Now, Anna's work begins from recreating herself as a pianist the recordings of the circle of pianists around Brahms in the last years of his life. Now, mostly pupils, not all, but mostly pupils of Clara Schumann. Some played, uh, seem as far as we can tell without having recordings of her, um, to have played more like her, and some played um, really not very like her at all. In fact, um, rather more like Brahms, rather wildly. Um, but what this work enables us to do is to, re, is to understand Brahms in a completely different way and to understand that our picture of Brahms as a rather heavy, classical, regular um, musician um, requiring a very um, round sound, very long lines, a very firmly pressing into the keys, a very controlled kind of Brahms, is completely at odds with both the recorded and the documentary evidence. That we've actually we've, we've turned Brahms into someone quite unlike the kind of musician that he was towards the end of his life. Anyway. Now, what Anna does is she copies, and through, through the embodiment I'm talking about, the process by which her body learns to make music in this way, um, she uh, is in a, a much better position to understand the, the underlying principles that were operating in um, performance style 100 years ago. And they're very, very different from our own. Let's begin just by hearing a fairly typical modern performance of the piece I want to look at first, which is the Intermezzo Op. 119, number 2 in B minor. Um, let's just listen to a little bit of this. Um, I can't remember the first name, Flatter. Okay, it's very lovely. It's sort of reverential. It's Brahms, Brahms as a god whom the pianist worships, as if every note is sacred. Now, let's listen to one of these pupils from, uh, one of Clara Schumann's pupils, and somebody um, who was close to Brahms. Um, this isn't just <clears throat> another late 19th century pianist. This is the person to whom Brahms first played this score. Privately, just for her and whom he allowed to give one of the first performances of it. So there's a reasonable chance that we're hearing something, something, um, which is not wildly misrepresenting the way it was um, in that rather wonderful moment when he played it to her. 
Um, who knows? But let's let's listen to a bit of this. If you don't know it, you'll be surprised. Well, of surprises. Um, <clears throat> now, we could spend another half an hour on, on the sort of context for that, explaining why that's not as unlikely as it sounds. Uh, there's masses of period evidence in support of that, um, which suggests it's also compatible with what we can hear off the cylinder of Brahms playing himself, um, but with lots of other things. So it's not, it's not our Brahms. It's a completely different Brahms. It's a Brahms that's completely incompatible with our Brahms, let's face it. You simply cannot get those two to talk to each other. Um, so something's happened. It's much more fantastic. Now, what's going on? Well, a number of things are going on. First of all, the hands are not um, synchronized. <clears throat> There's wild, uh, uh, extreme dislocation by our standards between the hands. Secondly, there's a great, great deal of what we would call rushing. Um, she accelerates through phrasing. This is not a structural performance. Structural performances were invented later. Um, the moments of greatest articulation come at key expressive moments within a phrase. The end of the phrase is hurried through. There's quite a lot of concatenation going on, actually excising beats which get in the way when the performance is getting excited. There's overlapping of the voices, sometimes by a beat or more, so that a voice in, in one hand can come in much earlier than it's notated to come in. Now, all these things are totally forbidden now. They're shocking now. They're outrageous. They're ridiculous. They're completely unacceptable. Um, if you did any one of these things, you would fail an exam and you would never get work. Well, they did all of them because... These were simply part of normal performance style at the end of the 19th century. And that just, it's a measure of how much has changed. And in that sense, it's also a measure of how much will change in the future and of how different things could be now if they were allowed to be. I think this is incredibly exciting. What we've just heard are techniques that were required then of uh, an expressive, persuasive so we know that they can work. They did work for them. Presumably they could work for us. Uh, it would certainly be interesting to try to get them to work. So let's now listen to a little bit of Anna's um, recreation of this.
Okay, I'm sorry to stop there, but I want to play you another of um, her examples in a second. So this is not a literal copy. What she's doing is she is um, using what Eibenschutz did uh, um, as a, a, a sort of a, a starting point. She has literally learned through her body to make these expressive gestures, to make pieces work like this. And every time she encounters the score, um, applying these approaches to meaning making, um, she's producing a slightly different result. But uh, um, it's, a, it's a, a really interesting indication that by rethinking some of the ways in which we make musical continuities, um, we would be able to open up all sorts of new possibilities with other scores. And so that's what she does. She goes on to play a number of scores that nobody recorded in the early days. So there are no models for this. And this is a particularly interesting one. So what this is teaching us is that there are many possible different musicalities. This one just happens to have a whole load of historical evidence behind it. So that if you believe passionately that the composer's intentions still matter, then here they are. <laughs> here they are. We're not doing it right at the moment. We are madly, wildly, disgracefully, shockingly, unforgivably misrepresenting Bach in the way that we conceive him at the moment. Um, but if, like me, you think that the composer's wishes are neither here nor there, then you can also see that the fact that scores like this can be made persuasive in so many different ways opens up enormously exciting possibilities. Once we allow ourselves to expose ourselves to them. Dangerous, but so exciting. So um, that's what follows, I think, from the work that Anne has been doing, and similarly, um, Sigurd Schlotterbeck had already done on Grieg. That's also very interesting. Have a look at that, too. And what I want to do the rest of the time is to invite um, Bobby Mitchell of this parish, um, accompanied by... Um, 
Eugene Fagelson from King's College London, to come and explore a rather different approach. And what they're going to do, I think, is to offer us some really practical techniques for um, thinking about scores in slightly different ways, practical techniques for developing a different relationship with, um, well, changing our expectations, our sense of what might be possible. Not directly using historical models, but um, a, a, a rather more um, contemporary approach, we might say. So I'll, I'll just hand over to um, Bobby and Eugene. Thank you, yeah. Uh, I prefer to speak without a microphone. Is this okay? Yeah. Very good. I will also use the old fashioned classical whiteboard. Here, I'll give you a hand. Um, As Dan has just said, I have been using many what I call pragmatic tools to experiment with musical texts that were endowed upon us from, for example, the 19th century. Um, these tools don't respect the composer's wishes. Uh, that's the point. Uh, I'll talk very quickly about, um, and I'll, I'll talk quickly about four different things that I like to do, and I'll show a small example. Uh, whereby you'll hear a longer attempt tonight at the concert. Following which, Eugene and I will demonstrate a very pragmatic and practical form of experimenting with tempo. So, because I think tempo and tempo modification is the most fruitful way to experiment with text, I'll write it down first. Uh, Eugene and I will demonstrate tempo modification um, experiments at the end. Uh, as Dan mentioned before, something that's very um, valuable, especially for keyboardists, or perhaps only for keyboardists, is hand this synchronization. I'm not going to spell that to you. Uh, instead of spelling it, I'll just demonstrate. Uh, the simple concept of playing hands together or not leads to a multitude of different options. Um, and right now I have in front of me Brahms from the C major sonata, uh, one phrase, which when the hands were to be played together sounds like this. Uh, ornamentation can be played before or after the left hand. Doesn't matter. Now, what if the left hand were to always come before the right? Uh, what if it were to always come after the right hand? Uh, what if this were to vary throughout the phrase? Described by Mendelssohn of uh, Andante con Mozart. Mm -hmm.
character distinction from you later, after we show our September month petition um, demonstration. Uh, these are under these fall into the category of what I consider to be non-extemporaneous ways of experimenting with text. In other words, I've been uh, restricting myself to playing the notes which have already been printed uh, or composed. Right? Uh, so this would be non extended uh, There are also very interesting ways to extemporize um, music. Um, also very pragmatic and simple ways. Uh, for example, if I take the harmonic reduction um, of Schumann, the original is sounding like this. And if I reduce those harmonies, superimposed the Mendelssohn structure. Then I'm already instantly able to, to improvise. This is the subject of my doctoral research in which I discussed law at the Institute. So it's uh, you have questions about this particular approach to uh, teaching yourself how to improvise, then please ask me. Uh, because I've presented this material a lot, I don't think I'll include it in this, uh, this particular lecture. But um, I'm going to write down the term. Where did, what happened to the good marker? I think I left it on the camera. <laughs> I have a collection. I'm going to write down superimpose uh, this is very related to apartmento and this is very much um, practice which is called zero based practice which uh, harpsichordists learn and I will also credit uh, Rudolf Luth with whom I work for um, uh, working with me on this method so I would like to acknowledge uh, my teachers for this. Now, I would like to spend a lot of time with me demonstrating a very um, prolific way to deal with tempo modification. Uh, for that, I would also like to credit the man who taught me this method, uh, a brilliant harpsichordist named Robert Gill. And um, Before we get to the stage, I'll write down the information that you need to know. Just so that I don't continue to take the markers back. Okay, is, um, is German accessible for most people? I can write. Um, for uh, English words. These are very hard for me to translate, as you'll see why. I mean, uh, there, you can use a direct translation, but I'll try here using the term restful, and then the Italian accelerando, and then I like to use the word hectic, which is not a direct translation, and then volentando. So, as mentioned, I learned uh, a very interesting tempo modification exercise um, from Robert Hill, the harpsichordist, and he calls this exercise RATS, uh, which is the, uh, um, the first letter of the four German terms, Uhui, which I translate as restful, uh, Anziehen, which is more or less to push, and I need the Italian accelerando. And uh, then Kaiten, which is hard to translate. Um, I translated it with the word hectic, which is not. It's not poetic at all, but Kaiten, so. so oh, okay. 
Okay, so I'm seeing it's a pull. Pull, so okay. You therefore accelerate. Yeah. The result. And if you push it, you therefore accelerate as well. But the dynamic, the energy that's behind either of those is just a pull. Okay, okay, that's and, interesting. And useful, I, yeah, it's a very useful thing of cosmology, where you want to push and where you pull. Oh yeah, but I think that, that clarifies this picture. I think I, I would be interested to hear what you think when we demonstrate what we're doing. Because this motion of pushing and pulling uh, takes place here, um, uh, back to back, actually. And Sleppen, perhaps you can help me translate Sleppen, but Sleppen is to, to pull back or to slow down. To drag. To drag, to drag. Yeah. Um, so, I ask for your patience in listening to the first phrase of the second movement of the Strauss Violin Sonata about 20 to 25 times. <laughs> um, and I'll be patient. Let's see what it
uh, letting our bodies navigate through that um, nonsensical uh, demand. We should play restful and play <laughs> restful and pulling at the same time. Now. <laughs> state model that I described. I think for time's sake, I'll let you hear what it sounds like when we change the size of the unit. So rather than work with one beat unit, Eugene and I are now going to work with two beat or one bar unit. And we're going to change the exercise from not just Ruiz and Nantian, but now there are four different stages that are described um, with different words. So first restful, the first two units, Although the first two beats will be played restfully, the second two beats will be played in a bold manner, and then the third group of two beats, hiding, which is being pushed, is that right? And then the fourth two beats will be flattened. So in an eight beat structure, we're going to go through four different stages of character and tempo modification. Is that clear? I have a question though. Can you do this and in fact get the response to the scoreboard for those two? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I just, I'll just recording <laughs> Oh yeah, is that at all? That's fine with me. I might add a, add a hit as well. Uh, right, sir. It's good. It does. It does there is a cognitive uh, load that, that that has to go into the processing that takes me a moment sometimes to remind which scale we're going. Eight B rest three.
last version, where we begin with a slip in the first bar, and the second bar will be really specific. <laughs> embodiment in music making. Uh, it's a very useful tool to help become aware of habits and how habits demand certain tempo changes. And furthermore, um, tempo modification is a practice that you hear in all of the historical recordings and a practice which I think can be exercised. Also a practice which needs quite a bit of sophistication before it can be effective. Uh, that's all I'd like to demonstrate at this moment, so perhaps it's time to uh, entertain questions. Or we'll take spontaneous orders from you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not pizza. <laughs> but we could play it like pizza. We could play it like pizza. Yeah. Yes. I think we've got time. We've got time now. Sure. How about drums? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Pizza. Yes. Well, one, I think, important thing to mention before we get drunk um, is that uh, ch changing fingerings is quite an interesting thing. I, I, I've been trying to you know, apply some of the fudge notes or not fudge notes. It's a lot of fun. I, I get like a 10 in the risk taking, I think, hopefully. Um, <laughs> but to, to change fingerings as you, as you go through all of these things and feel comfortable enough to get into that does it's, it's, it's shift very much. I think that's a good point, and I think spontaneously changing fingerings is just a part of this experimental process that can be um, that helps widen the physical vocabulary and how to play it. Yeah. So now we're going to play the drums. <clears throat>
That's an excellent question, and um, that's always the question with gender music. Partnerships in general, who's in charge and who has control. So it's an issue of politics. Uh, in a way, superimposing an absurd structure like this, or an absurd demand to make the music sound as though you're drunk, relinquishes that kind of control. It relinquishes the, the power structure to a third external demand. So we're both actually following an, an order rather than each other. Certainly, at one point, if, if the music is so separated, as you notice, then you have to make a, a, a decision whether or not to follow or to remain in your own space. But it's a difficult question to answer, and it's a very interesting facet to this way of working. And then, but isn't it great sometimes also to hear the, the sort of what happens when you do hold a note a little bit longer, and then you get that other type of dissonance or, or another type of harmony that you could play with? That is an option. Is Barlon actually signaling our imagination or not? And yeah, the requirement to play the music together as it's written on the page is also uh, not a part of historical performance practice. I think there are other questions. Yes, please. Yes. Um, so I was also at the headquarters of Robert Taylor Lover. Oh, yeah. And, um, it's interesting to me, you know, I mean, there's uh, just an observation that I have a feeling that even going away from this type of experiment, so to say, like a very practical experiment to have technical and I think that the, the change comes in becoming aware of your, um, of your habits. Those habits can be physical, they, they can be based on musical taste, but this exercise um, superimposes demands that your body must go through, and obviously some results don't sound as good as others. Uh, that's a decision that should either be made through aesthetic values, or, for example, some results also don't feel as physically satisfying as others. So the decision to interpret or play music a certain way could be based on an aesthetic superimposition on the physical navigation of the music. I certainly don't think that every way we played the Strauss is as equally successful, but uh, now the physical options are actually available to us thanks to the fact that we've already navigated those movements. Uh, and the interpreta interpretation then becomes a more conscious um, practice of choosing. I was going to ask a question as well, since we're just putting one parameter um, function towards the same central function, I was thinking there might be four articulations in this way as well. That's very difficult. I've tried it and I find it very difficult. And I think what this. Absolutely. This also exposes something quite obvious, something that I hear in historical recordings that I, I think Anna must have written about. The fact that when uh, a historical performer plays in a Talarano, there is usually also a crescendo. So this exposes the habit, of, I think it's a very musical habit, of um, speeding up and getting louder together, or slowing down and getting quieter. Things which uh, don't have to be separated. I think there are more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful demonstration. If you guys were going to say perform the piece, um, can you go through the full process? Are you going to choose something that you're going to say, okay, well, Anna is going to play it, but it's going to be like this? Or are you just going to go through the whole process and say, okay, whatever happens when you perform this, what happens? I prefer the second, which is obviously much um, riskier. Yeah. Uh, but I think this is a kind of warming up. It's a kind of getting to know each other or warming up. Exercise and I know this. Uh, we've done this a lot. We've done this for two years at least together. Mm. Well, on, yeah. On and off, obviously not every day. And today we'll play, we'll play it in some form tonight and maybe some was quite fun. I enjoyed that. So. But these exercises are in a way an excellent way of warming up so that the concert um, 
can happen any number of ways. And I think when, after doing them, I feel more enlightened as to what it might do. I mean, it's just like actually hearing each other's um, uh, habits. And in a way, also knowing how you react to an external command. For example, when I, I know how he sounds when he plays uh, in the cello one round. And you know how I sound. So I think that answers the question. Yeah. Just if I may come in, I think if we can remove some of the fear of being wrong, then it does leave open the possibility of not needing to decide.